Hello, friends. Thank you so much for watching this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. I want to first ask you to please like this video, subscribe. If you're not subscribed to our channel already, please do that so you can get a notification every time that we have a new video or new content available for you. And if you have any questions or reflections throughout the course of this study, please leave those in the comments below for others to see and so that your questions get answered. It's so wonderful to have you join us in this way, but would love to invite you and have you join us in person on Monday nights, every Monday at 7.30 in the Parish Hall at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel. If you can't join us in person, that's fine, but we would love for you to come. All backgrounds, all levels of faith experience and experience with the Bible are welcome. So we do hope to see you there. And without further ado, enjoy this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this evening, this opportunity to be in community together, and we pray for all those gathered here, all those who still may be on their way, and those who were unable to join us tonight. We ask, Lord, that all of our intentions, our worries, anxieties be lifted up to you, Lord. And especially for those of us here that we would be free to completely focus on your voice and on how you're speaking to us tonight through your word. We pray, Lord, that we would encounter you in sacred scripture and also in our conversations with one another. To guide our discussion, our thoughts, our questioning, and our reflection as we dive into your word. We pray for all those on our hearts and minds, we pray for uh, everyone here in this time that we have and share together. And we just give you thanks and praise, Lord, for all of the ways you showed up today in our lives, especially those that went unnoticed or unthanked. Bless us each in the ways we most need it, and this time we lay it at your feet, and we ask that your will be done. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are in Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be in verses 16 through 20, the last four verses of the Gospel of Matthew. This is the Gospel reading for this upcoming Sunday, which is, uh, we're celebrating Ascension Sunday this Sunday. Ascension is technically this Thursday, but in our diocese we observe it on the Sunday before Pentecost. So we're having the readings that you might hear this Thursday at Daily Mass also on Sunday. So this is our Gospel, Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. We're going to read through this three times because it's a shorter passage, a very familiar passage. And so as always, I invite you to kind of pretend as though you've never heard this before. Paint the picture in your mind as we read this through the first time. Jesus is meeting the 11 faithful disciples in the region of Galilee in the north after he has risen from the dead uh, to a place that has been pre-organized, it seems, from the context, so that he can commission them and give them this final exhortation before he's about to ascend into heaven. And so uh, we read in Matthew 28, starting in verse 16, first time through. The commissioning of the disciples. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, until the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So to read through this two more times, I invite you to listen uh, more deeply, follow the words as they are read, or just listen to them quietly and hang on them until you find maybe a word or a phrase that sparks something in your mind. It resonates with you personally based on something going on in your own life, something specific God is speaking to you individually. This does not have to be to interpret the text or to have any kind of major theological significance, but what speaks to you? even if it seems like an insignificant word or detail. Pay attention to those things as we read this two more times. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. 
Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, until the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments, look back over the passage and the things that stood out to you, And if you're listening or watching this later, please share with us what those things are. But for those of us here, we're going to take about the next 10 minutes. Share at your tables what stands out to you and why. What questions do you have about this reading? Share those together, and then we'll bring it back to the larger group for discussion. You're free to combine more tables if you would like or yeah, however you want. But anyways, take the next 10 minutes. (laughs) So a few things about this passage. Uh, before maybe we talk about things that stood out to you, questions you may have. Uh, The thing that's just kind of glaring to me is this theme in this passage of in our brokenness, in our humanity, God is with us. You see this in the very beginning where they go, it says the 11 disciples. That is a broken number, right? It's not the complete 12. It's the 12 minus Judas, the betrayer. 11 has the sense in Hebrew symbolism and in numerology with the Hebrew language of being incomplete, And they're going to Galilee, they're going to a place that's not the the area where Jesus culminated in his ministry. They're going back to the outskirts, back to the area of the Gentiles, and which is a symbol of the division that still exists culturally at the time. And they go up and it says they worshiped, but they doubted. Post-resurrection, Jesus has already risen, he's already appeared, he's already come and said, peace be with you, and still they doubt. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, oh, you guys are so dumb. No, he doesn't. He He doesn't deride them. He doesn't condemn them. He reminds them that it's not about them and their doubt. He says, all power on heaven and on earth has been given to you. No, to me. All power on heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he says, go therefore, meaning because all power in heaven has been given to me, Jesus, you can go and baptize, and make disciples, and teach. Not because of anything special and magnificent that you've done. Not because you've suddenly ascended to some higher level of faith and you're above everybody else. You're still broken in your doubt. We're in a place, geographically, that symbolizes this division and brokenness among the human family. And yet, because of the authority God has given me, because of the authority I have by being God himself, incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, here in the flesh, now risen from the dead, Because of my authority, you can go out and do these things. It is not superseded by your doubt. You don't have to show that you are earning or deserving of it. You don't have to undergo any type of certification or read any particular type of book. It is recognizing that God has the authority, that we don't. And when we do that, When we do that, that is when these miraculous things can happen. And we are reminded of that power when we remember that God is with us until the end of the age. That God is with you 
This has been a theme all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. If you remember the very beginning of Matthew, we're in cycle A, so we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. We took a little detour in John, and we'll still be sprinkling in John through the rest of this Easter season and a couple feast days after, but we'll be back in Matthew soon enough. But you may remember the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 1, verse 23, when there's the prophecy about the virgin bearing a son, and that's going to be Jesus. It says, they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. At the very beginning of Matthew and at the very end, we have this promise. And it shows up again in the ministry of St. Paul in Acts chapter 18. When Paul is ministering in Corinth, one night in a vision, the Lord says to Paul, Do not be afraid, go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. This is God's continuous message to you and to me from the very beginnings of the church all the way up until today and in the future until the end of this age. God is reminding us until he's back here again in visual like sight, until we can see him and he's coming on the clouds, he is still with us. And he is with you even in your doubt. He is with you in the midst of your sin. He is with you and me in the midst of our brokenness. He is with us on the best and the worst days of our life. He is with us when we are on that spiritual high point, when we're you know, fresh off a retreat, and he's with us when we're down in the pits, soaked in our sin, feeling like there is no further low that we could drop to. He is just as with us. Whether or not we experience that presence of him, that's a different story. You know, our sin can provide that division, that obstacle, but it doesn't mean he's not there. And it doesn't mean that his power and his authority is not seeking to claim us to do something great, to do something incredible. You have gifts, you have talents, you have charisms of the Holy Spirit. Do not disqualify yourself because of your doubt, because of your brokenness, because you don't feel worthy or good enough of the calling that God has for you. Because what he wants to bring about is healing and restoration. That's what he wants. He goes to a place of division, a region of Galilee. And this is what he's been doing also all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. From the very beginning of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1, in his lineage are Ruth and Rahab, Gentile women, non-Jewish women in the lineage of Jesus, recounting how God has worked even through them. In Matthew 2, we have wise men, magi from the east, not Jewish men, Gentiles coming to proclaim that a king has been born. In Matthew chapter 4, he withdraws to Galilee of the Gentiles. That's what it's called because of how overrun it is with the Gentile community. He prophesies in chapter 8 that many will come from east and west, and then he heals people in Gentile territory. He praises the Canaanite woman for her faith in Matthew 15. And then in Matthew 27, when he's on the cross, who is it that proclaims that surely this was the Son of God? It's not a Jewish person. It's a Roman centurion, a Gentile. All throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' kingship is being proclaimed, but it's also being recognized by those who have been ostracized and marginalized by the brokenness of the human family. Not part of the chosen people. Not teacher's pet. Not grade A on all the tests in terms of salvation history. Those who've been forgotten. Those who've been wearing the dunce cap in the corner. Those who haven't even been welcome in the class. Those are the ones that Jesus is working through time and time again. And this, brothers and sisters, really speaks to me this week because I still experience to this day so much division in the things that people say and do about within the church, about each other. Still within the church, I hear things about racial division, people joking, making racist jokes and racist humor, people who are representing the church, causing scandal, thinking that it's something that is okay with you know, because it might be aligned with other things that other conservative people might do. I see people aligning things that are very divisive and hateful with Catholic teaching. And it's just not the truth. Like, it needs to be said, like, the Daily Wire and Prager University are not branches of the magisterium. And I'm not saying there's bad things in them. Like, they say a lot of good things, but they're not Catholic theology. Fox News is not Catholic theology. If I knew the other end of the spectrum, I would say the same thing about them. I don't know what those networks and those groups are. I would just secular society in general, I guess you could say. But those things are not part of church teaching. There may be some good and some truth and some beauty in the midst of it. But sometimes we falsely align these ideas that are out there with Catholic belief and Catholic teaching. And there are even people in the Catholic world who do this 
People like Dr. Taylor Marshall, sometimes people like even Matt Fred, who I respect in a lot of other ways, they'll say things that are theological speculation and they'll assert their opinion or their beliefs as church teaching. And these things infiltrate and they cause division. They're not bringing people to be disciples of Jesus. They're not inspiring people to come back. If someone is a fly on the wall to our conversations, if those things come up and we start saying divisive or hateful things about them, whoever they are, another race, another political party, another belief system, whoever it may be, those people listening are not inspired to become Catholic. I guarantee you, they're not. We are causing scandal when we do these things, brothers and sisters. And this is a reality in the church, in our conversations, and we have to be aware of it, and we have to recognize it is not the gospel, because the gospel is about preaching this to all nations. The word for nations in Greek is ethne. It means all ethnicities, all peoples of every race, that all these social and racial dividing lines that Jesus experienced and tried to step over and cross during his lifetime, that they would dissolve. That's why it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no, not male or female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. And we have to recognize the ways that maybe we've brought division in our own life, whatever those things may be. As, me, as much as we might want to evangelize, we might think of all the people we want to share the faith with, we also have to think about who are the people I may have driven away? Who are the conversations, well, who are the conversations with that I may have hurt? I may have caused some kind of pain. Or some kind of misunderstanding. Is there a way I can pray for that person? Ask their forgiveness. Correct what I have done. Repent. Go to confession. For whatever those things may be. Because I'm tired, brothers and sisters, of hearing and seeing the division in a body of Christ that is supposed to be unified. And we are walking with limps and bruises as a body of Christ instead of walking together united in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just felt so compelled by the Holy Spirit this week to say that. So I don't know if that's for you or if that speaks anything to you. It doesn't really speak to the core of this passage, but it just felt so in my heart to share because I think it's something that really needs to be addressed in our world and in the church. And so whether it's for you or not, I hope it's something that you seek to work toward, that unity in the body of Christ. And you seek to, and myself included, look at the ways that I've maybe joked about or brought about division. I've belittled or discriminated against other people. Even if I thought it was funny, even if I thought it was joking, that's thing, those things still have a ripple effect in our attitude toward others and in the body of Christ. And that is not what the Holy Spirit is about. It's about bringing discipleship of all nations. And that will, you'll hear that echoed in the first reading this Sunday. Where it says, you will be my witnesses in, Ju in Jerusalem, throughout all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Every single person. So whoever we might characterize as they... That group, them, that other political party, that other gender, that other race, that other point of view, whoever we might belittle or talk about in a derogatory way, even if we think it's joking, Jesus wants them in heaven. They are made to be saints just as much as you are. And if we are not part of that mission, then very likely we are against it. End of soapbox. Uh, other, <laughs> other things that stand out in this passage. To you, any questions you have about this passage? Don't have to do any, with anything that I just said, but what resonates with you in this? What questions do you have? John. Do you think that the mountain, going up to the mountain, mm -hmm. I don't know why, it's probably, we don't know exactly where. Sure. But um, was it in Samaria that, you know, they worship, they don't know on their mountain. Isn't there some connection? Oh, yeah, Mount Gerizim, yeah. where he's talking to the woman at the well. Is there any connection here? I know the mountain yeah. is like, you know, Moses, you know, coming down with, with the tablets, the law. Yes. It's like a new law to some degree. Like, you know, sure. Students, right. So there's that. But the mountain part, I'm just trying to make sure, is it related to this? Um, it's speculation where it could be. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's probably not Mount Gerizim because it would specify it was in, if it was in Samaria. Galilee is the region north of Samaria. So if it were a specific mountain, it would likely be the mountain from the Sermon on the Mount or Mount Tabor where the transfiguration likely happened. So it, it might be either of those, but just literarily speaking, it's meant to signify, just like you said, that symbol of Moses going up on the mountain and then receiving the law and sending out the elders, sending out the Jewish people. So, yeah, exactly. But we don't know specifically where. Yes? This entire reading is post-Pentecost, right? Pre-Pentecost, post-resurrection. Okay. 
okay, that makes sense why there's a lot of doubt because yes. <laughs> being confused as well if I saw Jesus resurrected when I thought he died. Yes. And the timeline can be very confusing at the end of the Gospels and going into Acts chapter 1 because the purpose of the Gospel writers is not to write like a Dear Diary captain's log every single day. They're, they're doing a highlight reel. And so sometimes one paragraph to the next will be several weeks. I mean, the Gospel of John, you have 13 chapters that span three years. There's three Passovers. And so they skip a lot. And so it seems as though things are happening very quickly, almost quickly than they do in other Gospels. And so sometimes it can be hard to pinpoint exactly where this is. Matthew doesn't have the giving of the Holy Spirit as clearly as the other Gospels do or as Acts of the Apostles do. So based on the sequence of events, we assume that this is pre-Pentecost. And it would be because, yes, Jesus is still there. So if Jesus is still there, pre-Pentecost. Because he's not there at Pentecost. He's already ascended. Yeah. Yes? A question I brought it up in the group when I looked up on Catholic.org the gospel for this Sunday is John chapter 17 verses 1 to 11. Yes, so that's the. Am I missing something? No, so that I mentioned at the beginning that's the gospel for the seventh Sunday of Easter, which would be this Sunday. But in this diocese, we celebrate the Feast of the Ascension, which is this Thursday. We move that to the Sunday. So we're getting the readings for this Thursday's Feast of Ascension which would normally be a holy day of obligation, in order to get more Catholics to observe that holy day, the bishops have decided to move that, and they've done that for many years, move that to the uh, following Sunday. So it goes Ascension Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. But, sure, yes, yeah, yeah. But that's normally not moved to the Sunday. It's just you can, you can eat meat if it's on Friday, yeah. But this is that in order to observe the holy day, move it to the Sunday, because every day, every Sunday is a holy day. Um, Holy Day of Obligation. So that's why. So yeah, depending on the church you go to, they may do the seventh Sunday of Easter readings. Here we will do, I assume, the Ascension Sunday, which is why I chose it for the study. But just in case, you might want to read John 17, 1 through 11. Um, it's part of the priestly prayer, prayer of Jesus about uh, his desire for all to be one. And there's a lot of uh, imagery in there that uh, some people characterize that section as the version of the Our Father in the Gospel of John. A little bit more spread out, but you'll notice you know, Father being praised in glory, holy is his name, uh, awaiting his kingdom, a lot of these lines from the Our Father. And then I believe it ends with the desire that all would be one, which very much aligns with what we're talking about in this gospel. So, yeah, there's some similarity, but that's why there's the difference. Thank you. Yeah, Chris. You know, I to all power in heaven and on earth. Like that's like a pretty powerful statement to say. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of why we say it uh, like in Jesus' name? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because we don't have the power and authority to do anything. You know, um, even priests who are exorcists, there's a designated exorcist in every diocese in the world. Um, so there are, I don't know how many dioceses, but lots of exorcists in the world. Um, they all only are given the authority that they have to do that by virtue of their priesthood, which is given to them by the bishop, which is given to them by Jesus Christ. And when they are in the midst of uh, an exorcism, all of the prayers of deliverance and of exorcism are done in the name of Jesus. Everything is in the name of Jesus. So if you're commanding you know, a demon to reveal something, they will often say, by the name of Jesus or in the name of Jesus, what is your name? In the name of Jesus, I command you to be gone. In the name of Jesus, I command you to tell me how you got in and what is your mission. They'll ask questions like that, but they always lead with that statement because Jesus is God, and God created everything, including the angels that became demons. And so he still exercises authority over them. The devil, the devil and God are not like this. It's like the devil and St. Michael the Archangel. And God is like way up here, like so much more powerful, has so much more authority. But he has respected the free will of all of his creation to obey him or to disobey him. He will intervene when asked, so he still demonstrates authority. And that's why Satan has lost. He knows he has lost because Jesus died for our sins on the cross. And so I characterize it as like, when Jesus died on the cross, it was the KO punch to Satan. And the rest of history from that point forward is the slow motion of Satan just falling to hit the mat. And he's just kind of grasping for anyone who he can get down with him. But that's really the story. Like Satan has already been defeated. He's already going to hit the mat. And it's just a matter of who he can pull with down with him. So, yeah, but he still exercises authority, which is why his name is a powerful prayer to pray. The most powerful, the simplest prayer you can pray every day is the name of Jesus. And if ever you're experiencing any kind of 
oppression, oppressive thought, something that you feel is dark or of the enemy, you're feeling attacked spiritually, you can, as a lay person, say over yourself or over another person what is called a prayer of deliverance, where you could just say, in the name of Jesus, I bind and renounce you, Satan, be gone. Or in the name of Jesus, be gone. And you just say that and out loud, has to be out loud, and you use that phrase in the name of Jesus. And that can command authority over at least certain minor uh, manifestations of demonic activity. The more major ones is why we have the ministry of exorcism. So, yeah. Yes? Um, I'm not sure if this has to do with the past, but I think it kind of does. But I just, like, personally for me, I've been trying to understand, like, Jesus as, like, fully man, fully God. So I just think about how we're called to be in full communion with Jesus and God. Mm -hmm. and eventually, as we're purified, we're in full communion with God. Does that... I don't know what the Catholic Church teaches, but do we become God like when we're in heaven? Like I was just trying to understand what it means to be in full communion. Like I know like the Holy Spirit binds us all. We are one body. Yeah. Like it sounds like we become, I don't want to say like a God, we become God. Like we're in full communion. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's in Scripture. There is a Scripture that says Jesus became man so man could become God. Uh, but the interpretation of that is not like there. there is a belief in some of the, um, the eschatology of the Mormon church, for instance, that when you die, you literally become a God of your own kind of afterlife and planet. But that's not uh, the end of all things. That's kind of a perpetual belief that happens in their, that's not what would happen in their version of the final judgment. Everything would end. Um, what, how we take that is that when we were created, everything was in union with God. Like everything you could say was caught up in God. And we are one in the Lord because we are animated by God and the Holy Spirit. By virtue of the fact that we have a soul, that we are alive, it is because God is in us and willing us into existence. And we have an eternal soul and God is eternal. So we are, in, in essence, eternally connected to God. The, the uh, obstacle to that is our fallen nature and our sin. And so we're not experiencing the fullness of communion yet because of that. Heaven would be where we experience that. However, we would not be experiencing it as like we are taken up into the being that is God and we just are kind of absorbed. We maintain the fact that we are a distinct soul. We are a distinct body. Those things will be purified and resurrected in our life in heaven. And we will experience that individually as part of the community of heaven for all eternity. So it wouldn't become some kind of like pantheistic God is everywhere and everything, and we kind of all get caught up into him like some supernatural force or anything like that. You still maintain your identity as a unique created being of God, body and soul. But ideally, that communion is kind of that sense of being caught up into perfect unity with God. Um, kind of the difference between going from engaged to being married. You know, it's like you two are in unique relationship, and there's still a separation, a barrier there. You have not reach that, the throes of intimacy and the ability to create your own family. When you go into heaven, all of that is kind of washed away. And now you are caught up in one another to create this new abundance of love in heaven. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, no. yeah it, it makes more sense to be asked you talking. I just think of like the movie like Avatar, how like everyone was just absorbed <laughs> into one. So I wasn't sure if that's like what we thought. Like, and, yeah, we all maintain like our individuality. But I wonder if that's just like how we maintain the relationship with like the people on earth still, like, like mm -hmm. the saints, right, or people that deceased that are in heaven. Like, are they actually, you know, those same people, or are they just like that's how we communicate with them who are connected to God? So them being in heaven, are they different than when they were here? Yeah. I mean, yes, but heaven is outside of time which is the problem. We're experiencing our end of the relationship with the divine in time. And when we die, we will go outside of time. And so this is, this gets very like into like, yeah, mind blowing multiversal kind of things. But like, I kind of have a spec, this is speculative theology. This is just Matt's opinion. This isn't like an official church teaching, but I kind of have a belief that when we die, we enter into timelessness and the experience of heaven, whereas when we die, we simultaneously experience like everyone who will be in heaven at once. So like you have this kind of thought sometimes like, okay, when I die, like am I going to be up there waiting for my family to get there? And my thought, theologically speaking, is no, because God's outside of time. 
all that death will have happened in time, and I'll experience heaven like simultaneously with God in eternity. And so they'll kind of already be there in one sense, but also not yet because there's purgatory before that. But that's just kind of my own opinion is that when we die, we enter into the timelessness of God. Um, yes, the last judgment is there. All that stuff happens in time. But our own personal experience might be so that we experience it all simultaneously. Like everyone there who's going to be in heaven in eternity will be there when we get there. Um, that's just my thought. Do you have something to add, John? Oh, no. I was just going to say before or after purgatory. Yes. No, no, no. Yes. Purgatory is still there. Final judgment is still there. I'm not going to mull over a current, like, existing theology. But, yeah, that's that's just kind of my own thought. Yeah. With the angels, yes, yeah. yeah. No, with us too. Like, yeah, like, when we go to heaven, we're all going to be just like compiled together. It's tiered in heaven, the same way it's tiered with the angels. Like, are you familiar with that? Um, I'm not, but I, be, I do believe it's a matter of private revelation. And it's not part of the doctrine right, of the church. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Like, yes, yeah. yeah. So you're not really in, like, in accordance with that, but you've heard of it. I've heard of it. There is some, okay, so there is some credence to that because um, when we talk about the saints in heaven, okay, we give the saints honor. In Latin, the word is dulia. Um, but to Mary, we give hyperdulia, highest honor. And there's been a tradition in the church, uh, according to St. Joseph, that we give him protodulia, first honor among the rest of the saints. So there is among those holy ones in heaven, whether they have sinned or have not sinned, Mary and Joseph, there is kind of a hierarchy, but that hierarchy depends on our relationship with them here. Now, we don't really know how that will change or be realized in heaven. So there, there is implications in the Bible that there could be this hierarchical kind of relationship with God. But at the same time, even the, if there were, let's say, a hierarchy in heaven, those at the lowest rung of that hierarchy would experience no inequality. Yeah, they're still in heaven. Yes, but they wouldn't even have an awareness of like being detrimental. They would understand and be fully alive where they were in that hierarchy. Also sharing the, the like, yes. Because I've heard it talked about too, so all the fallen angels, like their ranks, um, when we, when we ascend, we take their ranks basically, like that kind of situation. Mm, I don't know about that because humans don't become angels. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the, the tier is like, we're not, we don't become angels, like we take the rank. Like yeah, but the rank comes with specific responsibilities that are accorded to an angel and an angelic being, not a human being. Okay. So that, that would be theologically potentially problematic. Okay. So, yeah. But it's a matter of private revelation, so yeah. you can believe it or you don't have to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yes? I just had a question. Uh, you brought up communion with God in heaven. Um, what's your take on the difference between communion, communion when we reach heaven versus communion when we uh, practice or engage in Mass, um, when we consume the Eucharist? Well, at every Mass, we believe that heaven literally touches earth. The angels and saints are present, and so, in, in essence, a mystical and theological, or a mystical window opens up to heaven, where heaven literally kind of comes down and scoops up that part of earth. That's why, if you've ever noticed in churches, our church is kind of a little architecturally off, uh, because in, in most Catholic churches, you have three steps leading up to the altar. Ours only has two. And then there's kind of two more leading up to the presider's chair. It's a little weird. Um, but there's supposed to be three to imply the three persons of the Trinity. And you are ascending into a heavenly plane when you partake in what is happening on the altar during Mass. And so there's a lot of symbolism of that to help communicate the mystical reality of what's happening in the Mass. So there is this sense of heavenly communion. But here on earth, even though... In the Eucharist is the probably most concentrated presence of God, of Jesus, that we can receive. It's his body, blood, soul, and divinity here on earth. I would argue it's probably just a sliver of what we will experience in heaven. And yet the heaven is characterized as the wedding feast of the Lamb, like a, a divine mass of all of us celebrating that once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ in perpetuity for all eternity. So it's a window into the perfected version that we'll experience on earth. But there in no way comparative because we're struggling with sin, brokenness, our inability to experience the fullness of that here on earth. But it's probably the closest we can get here on earth, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there was that, uh, that Latin phrase that says, like, the Eucharist will work on it, how um, 
much we're willing to basically let it. There's this like I can't ring. You'll it'll ring it'll ring a bell eventually. But basically, mm -hmm. it's yeah because we like there are saints you know that that have ecstasy right and, mm -hmm. and without the Eucharist. So like it's possibly without in some sense right. But but because of our sin, we can't really fully experience it to make it yeah possible, right. I mean, that's basically that's why it'll be. If you were perfect, maybe you would be. Yeah. Comparable, yeah. We don't know. Yeah, that's why the word apocalypse for the end of the world in Greek, apocalypsos, means the unveiling. It's as if the veil of sin that is over our eyes every single day will be lifted and we'll finally be able to see heaven in its reality and its glory, either because we are going to it or we are in the midst of losing it and going away from it. But we will still experience some version of that in that unveiling. Other questions? Thoughts? Things that stood out to you in this passage? No one has a burning question? Yes? I'm a TV person. So, if they've got this thing on television, are you going to heaven? Have you seen it yet? Oh, I have not, no. I'd be interested to hear what they say. <laughs> Because they have all the questions, like what if you just did Google? Uh huh. And there's all these questions about heaven. And it, it's the answers, I think, are coming from all sorts of sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think it would be that complicated in reality. Um, are you going to heaven? Have you repented of your sin? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you received salvation by being baptized? And have you remained in a state of grace? That's it. That's all it takes. Repent, believe, receive, remain. That's all it takes to be saved as a Catholic. So there was a laundry list of questions. Odds are it was not a Catholic thing that you were watching. Yeah. Yes. What does it mean to be baptized? Like ba baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when I, when I, when I hear the word baptize, I think of water mm -hmm. and, and maybe just the Holy Spirit or something. Yeah. Well, uh, and the word for baptism would imply water because it means to plunge or to immerse in Greek, um, or sometimes to drown. So you can do none of those things without water. Um, every sacrament has what's called a matter and a form. The matter is the tangible thing that is used for the sacrament. It's a way in which God can, in a sense, be with us, that we can experience something that we can touch, taste, see. It makes the invisible visible. The form is the words that are said, the things proper to the right. If either of those are improperly used or not present, the sacrament is not valid. And so for us in the Catholic tradition, in order for baptism to be valid, either in our tradition or in any other tradition, because we recognize non-Catholic Christian baptisms, it has to be done with pouring water on the head three times while it is said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son of the, and of the Holy Spirit, because the matter and the form are given to us by Jesus right here. And we don't have the authority to change that. So even if someone is, let's say, an atheist on the side of the freeway and they've gotten in an accident, they're having a crisis of faith, and, and a Presbyterian comes along and says, have you been baptized? And they say, no, but I want to be. And if they intend to do what the church intends to do when they baptize and they use the proper formula, their baptism would be recognized by the Catholic Church. If they were to convert to Catholicism, we would not baptize them. We would say, your baptism happened on the five freeway that day by that Presbyterian minister. That's a valid baptism. And we'll receive you into the church, and you'll receive First Communion and Confirmation after going through Catholic preparation through RCIA. So that's, that's because uh, baptism is the sacrament of salvation. That's what it says in the Catechism, that salvation is bound to the, bapti to the sacrament of baptism. God is not bound by his sacraments. It makes that caveat. So God can save however he chooses to save those who are unable to receive baptism or outside of the ability to do so. But the ordinary means for salvation is baptism. So, because it's available to anyone, technically in an emergency, anyone can baptize if they have the proper matter and form. So, next time you're driving down the road, make sure you have holy water and maybe a little card or this Bible passage in your car, because you never know who you're going to need to baptize in an emergency situation on the side of the fried freeway. So, yeah. I had a question. Yes. Uh, are submersive baptisms not valid then? Uh, you can fully immerse, but there usually is like a threefold action that happens. 
so you can do that, but usually because there is not that threefold, people tend to either, like here we have them get in the water and then water's poured over them if they're an adult, or if they're a baby, they're held over the font and it's poured over their head three times. Um, so if the matter and form are proper, you can fully emerge, uh, emerge yourself. And in fact, there are some people who get baptized here because you can get fully in the font. They'll like do the three times and then they'll like dunk tank it and they'll go fully under just to get the full experience of coming, coming out. We like two people do that this year. So, but it's not usually, it's usually not the proper form because there's confusion as to whether the threefold pouring happened. And that's just something that's are always historically been part of the, the matter and the form. Yeah. Yeah, John. Uh, so you know how matrimony, the, the form, it's actually um, the, the spouse, the, the two people actually confer it on each other? Yes. Uh, what's the matter? Um, the vows. The vows. And, uh, and potentially the rings. Okay. I don't know if there, you have to exchange rings in the, in the ordinary rite of matrimony. I haven't read it in a while, and I know it was recently revised. Um, but I believe it's the vows. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you have a question, Chris? No? Okay. I thought I saw your hand up before, John. No? Oh, well, I'm supporting you. Yes, please. Form. Yes. Um, I've been in confessions where the form is invalid, and mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, something worth mentioning. The, the, the form for the priest should say something to the effect of, by the power of the church, something, something, and then I, um, I absolve you from your sins, not I forgive you. Yes, yeah, he has to say the proper right. The priest is not forgiving you of your sins. He's absolving you in the name of Jesus. So, and, and so that, that is irking sometimes in the situations where it's like, no, this is not right. Do I want to get over in this subject? I do. Yeah. Well, and that uh, rubric recently changed as well. It's the most recent uh, form to change, that their uh, prayer of absolution, the wording has changed. And so they've all, they're all having to memorize a brand new one. So there may be some mistakes, so it's important that you know that, that you have to hear those words, I absolve you of your sins, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the change? The change is, um, oh my gosh. The power of my resurrection. Reconcile for us the forgiveness of sins. There's something where he says poured out now instead of something else. I think it's poured out. And then I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the words of absolution have not changed, but there's some technical change in the language before that, I think. It's like one or two phrases. So, yeah, yes? So this is unrelated, but I, didn't, I always like to ask this question. It's a great question, I think. I haven't got a good answer yet. Okay, so, shoot. Uh, it's related to matrimony. Sorry, what was that? It's related to matrimony. Okay. And when you, when you, you know, uh, it's till death do you part, right? Yes. This is the, the thing. But till today, in the Mass, we refer to St. Joseph as the spouse of the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. which is a little not cons consistent with this. Sure, but yes. So what is this? What am I supposed to do with that? Well, it's a recognition of his earthly relationship to Mary. Yeah. Just like we recognize Mary as mother of God in her earthly relationship to Jesus, she is not the mother of the divine person who is eternally God in the same way. She does have that title. Um, so it's a recognition of the earthly relationship. And in heaven, a spousal relationship here on earth, the catechism teaches that marriage is the, uh, is a window into, or is a foretaste of heaven. The marital embrace is a foretaste of the heavenly embrace. So in essence, the spousal relationship on earth is the base level type of relationship we'll have with everyone. So technically there's still spousal. There's just not this, um, yeah, exclusivity of the matrimonial covenant because the relationships we have in heaven are so far beyond that, that it would be kind of simple. It, like it wouldn't really make sense. Um, the only kind of equivalent I could think I can think of in the moment is like, you know, if, if you have like two, like I imagine like me in third grade and I'm like holding hands with a girl and I'm like, oh my gosh, we're holding hands. Like, this is amazing. Like, this is the coolest <laughs> thing ever. Like, and then someone would try to explain to me like what happens when you get married and what you do on your wedding night. I'd be like, I can't even wrap my mind or why are you telling me this? That's like weird and bizarre. Like, I don't even get that. But then when you're older, Let's say now we're in heaven and we understand the full embrace of heaven. If someone in heaven were to be like, yeah, but don't you want to just go hold hands? I'm like, no, I can do this now. Like, I mean, yeah, sure, that's fine. But, you know, so it's that kind of relationship, you know, it's like the fullness of the, revel uh, the relationship we can have with God, with others, with everyone is spiritually 
higher than the physical intimacy we can experience in marriage here on earth, if that makes sense. So it's still proper to use that title because titles of many things that saints have done, places they're from, patronages they have, have solely to do with things they did on earth. Yeah. I hope that was a better answer than you've gotten. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it has something to do with like kind of having a like a just you know virginal marriage. Um, oh yeah, like something like because isn't there some place in Revelation where it talks about the the people who are defiled just being married versus the undefiled um, being the virgin? So there is there is a way to interpret it that way. Yeah, virginity. Yeah. In this, you know, context. So like, yeah, I mean, you could interpret it that way. There is under the. <sighs> Uh, under the section of the consecrated religious life in the catechism, there are five categories of the religious life. And one of those is consecrated virginity. And I believe the purpose of consecrated virginity in the catechism says that their purpose is to signify, you know, there to be an eschatological sign of marriage to Christ on earth. So a preview of the end times of what we're going to experience in heaven. They're meant to be a representative of that on earth. So because Joseph and Mary did that and they're consecrated virginity to one another, they are the chief sign of our marital relationship with God in heaven. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride. And so they retain that title, you could argue, because they were that sign. Yeah, you had me reaching there. That was... <laughs> John. Uh, I have an interesting thing to share. You can call it a, a, a private revelation or whatnot. It relates to the hierarchies within heaven that you were talking about. Um, it's been revealed to me, and it's my suspicion and personal belief, that the apostles, the 12 apostles, still rule over the kingdoms of Israel in heaven, and that they are like eternally, like, like heaven is sort of sorted into this these 12 separate tribes still, and that souls that go to heaven belong to one of them. Hmm. And Crazy. maybe even potentially in heaven work for, in a hierarchical way, one of the apostles. Um, Interesting. To carry out God's will, yeah. you know, on, in heaven and on earth. Just one nice. Well, there is a, a somewhat biblical basis for that, too, in the revelation of John, in the book of Revelation, the last two chapters, when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, the new temple, is founded on pillars, 12 pillars that are inscribed with the names of the 12 apostles. So you could, as a kind of eschatological interpretation of that passage, have kind of that type of private revelation interpretation. There wouldn't be anything necessarily problematic with that. Yeah. The question I would have is what work needs to be done in heaven? You know, once everything is completed here, you know, what for what purpose? You know, well, so. I, think souls, I mean, so I, I sort of disagree with your point earlier that you made about about how heaven is sort of a, a, an experience of an eternal now, and that it's separate from time in the sense that everything has already happened. I sort of disagree with that. Um, so I actually think like souls in heaven are working towards. Um, carrying out God's will on earth in a way, you know, because the world hasn't ended yet, right? The mm -hmm. second coming of Christ hasn't happened yet. And so there's more to be done in the world and on earth until that comes to fruition. And I think souls in heaven are actively working in addition to maybe other things. Like mm -hmm. I think God's universe and, and his creation spiritually and physically is like so much bigger than we think. So there could be a whole host of other things that souls in heaven might be working mm -hmm. or whatever. But as far as it, it relates to Earth, I think souls of heaven could be and probably are actively working towards fulfilling God's will on Earth. Interesting. Yeah. Because we know they intercede. They, they yes. Intercede yeah. Absolutely. Right? So. Yeah, and the things that are done in heaven for our intercession affect us on Earth. So, and it's not that everything when we get to heaven, my thoughts on kind of the time are, will be in the past. Everything will be as now. The past, the present, and the future will be as now. Because that's how God is eternally present to us. And so that's why there's this kind of uh, speculative theological practice where you can pray for people in the past. You know? Yeah, or, you, you know, we all pray for people in the future, you know, like future spouse, future children, future things that will happen. But to pray for, like, you know, Adam and Eve or things like that. Not that it will necessarily change what happened, but who knows how your prayers have already been built into salvation history to affect people in a certain way to then lead to the situation we have now. 
And so like when I, the podcast that I have, when I ask people to pray for me, I'm like, you're not going to hear this when this is happening, but pray anyway, because Jesus has the power to retroactively apply anything you say to my situation now. And so that's true. Like we can pray for people, things that we've done in the past, but also pray to affect the past. People we've hurt. We can pray for like that person I hurt in the past. I want to pray now for God to give them the grace to interpret what I did or what I said more charitably than I deserve. You know, and who knows how that can affect them. And maybe they have ever since because in the future you prayed for them. It's wild. So maybe it's some something you can do tonight when you go home. <laughs> it's kind of always that way though. Yeah. Because um, when you choose not to sin today, now, uh, you are effectively lightening the load that Jesus had to carry. So your actions sure. are retroactively applied to the past, like all the time. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard it put that way before, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, one last thing, and then we got to end. We're a little over time. <laughs> like, man, I really want to work at the outlet mall. Like, I might be really good in sales. I mean, there are specific jobs in the hierarchy in the order of angels. So... Um, you know, and there, is, there are models for this in the Garden of Eden. You know, my question posed to Johnny was not that I disagree. I'm, I'm just curious about what might work like, look like in heaven because there was work in the Garden before the fall. That it was up to Adam and Eve to be stewards and protectors over everything in the Garden, and that required work. But it wouldn't have felt like work in the laborious sense that we see work now. And so it's an interesting thing to think about. So we all, we all, all have a role to play now in the, the, the great plan scheme I don't want to call it a scheme. That was a bad choice of words. But the great plan of God, the mission of God to build the kingdom here on earth. And it would then imply that we have some type of job or role in heaven. And so who knows how time is playing and how us future in heaven are affecting the reality now. Who knows? Like that's another crazy thing to think about. Um, so because to us, to God, we're all, you know, his where he's present to us, you know, so. I don't know. We can get into some wild places. So if you want to get into some wild places, maybe stick around and we'll have further conversations. But anyways, let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this night and this study and this word. Help us to recognize that even in the midst of our brokenness, our doubt, our misunderstandings, our failings, our division, uh, that you are with us. That is by your power and your authority that supernatural things happen, that the Holy Spirit is present in us and that you give us the strength to evangelize, to use our gifts, to learn, to share, to bring others into knowledge of you and into relationship with you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to never forget that you are with us always until the end of the age. And it is not by anything we do or earn or merit for ourselves, but it's solely by your power, the grace you won for us on the cross and the mercy and forgiveness you constantly extend to us that we can do anything that we are alive and breathing at this moment. But you choose for us to be co-creators with you in this great kingdom. And so help us to know what that role is, that mission is, and to fulfill it with love, with passion, and with zeal. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.